A very good morning to all of you. I hope you can all hear me now. See, uh, we had a bit of a technical difficulty in the morning, so we apologize for the delay. Uh, but we are very glad we are here even during this crisis situation. And we are very happy that we have over 120 participants for today's webinar. So without any further ado, let me start with the housekeeping rules. The webinar link will be available from 9 a.m. to 9.45 a.m. for all of you to join in and no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each attendee should have been attended till the end of the webinar to obtain the certificate for CPD points. And as you know, these CPD points are strictly adhered to the NCCPD guidelines. We have implemented these rules to improve and maintain the standards of our CPD programs conducted here at SHRI and GMOA. We thank you once again for complying to with all our rules and regulations and for your kind compliance in coming every single week and joining in our sessions. I would also request all of you as usual to switch off your video and to keep your microphones on mute. And we welcome you to please type in any of your queries you have in our chat function so that we can discuss on this after the webinar. So we welcome you to enjoy and join this webinar on this very timely topic of an update on thyroid. And I would, as usual, invite Dr. Himal to give an introduction to our very distinguished uh, speaker for this evening. Over to you, Ayer. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can hear you. Right. Uh, I'm really sorry for this delay because we are currently encountering big issues with the connecting issues. Uh, due to this power crisis and a lot of connection issues. Uh, you might not see me now. Okay. Right. But I'm really grateful to you joining with us, difficult period uh, with us. So, uh, without further ado, let me introduce today's this, our distinguished guest uh, speaker. He is Dr. Uh, Aranindan Mahaliyam, uh, who is a consultant and endocrinologist. Uh, currently working in teaching of Jaffna. He is a well distinguished and famous lecturer in this endocrinology topic, especially in thyroid disease. He has done a lot of research work in uh, around this field. So since we are uh, running a uh, lot of uh, time schedule behind, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Aravinda to uh, continue his talk. Sir, Dr. Narayanan, sir, uh, the session is over to you. And uh, let me remind you, uh, this is again a collaboration session of Sri Lankan College of Internal Medicine and GMO Sri. And there are two people I have to mention, uh, especially regarding this session, uh, to who is uh, coordinating this, is uh, Dr. Nandini and Dr. Ganaka as the president of SLCIM. Okay. Sir, uh, Dr. Narayanan. The session is over to you, sir. Very good morning to all of you. So you may listen me now. Can you hear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can all hear you. Okay. Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to discuss something about thyroid disorders. And uh, sorry for the technical issues. Uh, thyroid issues, uh, you know, from the ancient history, we can see the thyroid disorder is a very common disease. And even in ancient sculpture and everything, you can see the first one to introduce uh, thyroid disorders uh, uh, to the world is uh, Leonardo da Vinci. He has mentioned in his portrait, we can see nicely the thyroid disorders, even in Mona Lisa. And uh, thyroid, especially the hypothyroidism prevalence is very high. So one of the Indian study nicely mentioned the prevalence of hypothyroidism is around 10%. Even a lot of Sri Lankan studies uh, clearly mention the prevalence of hypothyroidism is around 10 to 15% uh, in Sri Lanka. So why we need to think about thyroid hormone issues? Because thyroid hormone act on several parts a lot of parts in our body. It promotes normal fetal and childhood growth and development and regulate the cardiovascular system, mainly the heart rate, uh, myocardial contractility and cardiac output and maintain the ventilatory response and modulate body energy expenditure and weight. 
and um, it influences the lipid and carbohydrate metabolism and stimulate bone turnover and affect the GI motility. So if we consider the hypothyroidism, we may divide into overt hypothyroidism and uh, subclinical hypothyroidism. Subclinical usually asymptomatic. In subclinical, we can see the T3, T4 is normal, but TSH is high. But overt or frank hypothyroidism, it presents with symptoms of hypothyroidism. And there, usually T3, T4 is low, but TSH is high. So, so we can classify or we can divide the hypothyroidism into primary hypothyroidism, secondary, and tertiary. Some people use tertiary. So primary means from thyroid destruction, from thyroid destruction. That means problem in the gland. So what will happen? T4 is low and TSH is high. Secondary hypothyroidism is the main problem is in the pituitary. So usually the TSH is low and uh, free T4 also low. So if we see the causes of hypothyroidism, uh, usually we think iodine deficiency is the main reason for hypothyroidism, but these days iodine deficiency is not a common reason. The main reason it commonly happened in females. So autoimmunity is the main reason for hypothyroidism. And damage and inflammation of the thyroid tissue, maybe thyroiditis and iatrogenic, the use of radioactive iodine or any surgeries and environmental factors and very rarely secondary causes like pituitary or hypothalamic causes can cause hypothyroidism. So as we mentioned, we can divide hypothyroidism into congenital hypothyroidism and thyroid tissue, tissue destruction. And the third one is iatrogenic. So the main cause for hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, it's a chronic inflammatory autoimmune disease characterized by destruction of the thyroid gland by autoantibodies against thyroglobulin and thyroperoxidase. Patient usually present with hypothyroidism features and painless goiter and other overt signs. And uh, as we all know, uh, the main reason is autoimmunity. So autoimmune hypothyroidism may have other concomitant autoimmune disorders and most commonly associated with type one diabetes. So when we see the clinical features of hypothyroidism, we all know it, it has a wide spectrum of presentation, starting with the tiredness, forgetfulness, and depression, inability to concentrate, thinning of hair, and dry skin, weight gain, cold intolerance, and uh, signs like puffy face, enlarged thyroid, hoarseness of voice, and difficulty in swallowing, and patient may present with heavy menstrual bleeding, and infertility or subfertility, and constipation, and muscle weakness. There are so many various presentations for hypothyroidism. So for the diagnosis of hypothyroidism, we need thyroid function test. Usually we do TSH with free T4. And TSH is high in primary hypothyroidism, and free T4 is low in hypothyroidism. And for the confirmation or find out the etiology, we can do antibodies like thyroid anti-TPO antibodies or thyroglobulin antibodies. And usually in autoimmune hypothyroidism, these are positive. So if uh, for this is just for the information, uh, we do TSH, depend on the TSH level, we go further. If TSH high, we need to do the free T4. If free T4 low, the diagnosis is hypothyroidism, that's primary hypothyroidism. In a patient TSH high, free T4 normal, then we need to consider it as subclinical hypothyroidism. So for the initial diagnosis of hypothyroidism, it's better to do both investigation together, TSH and free T4, because uh, then only we can say what type of hypothyroidism. For the monitoring, no need to do all these things, we can just monitor with TSH. So this is an algorithm how to interpret the thyroid function results. Um, you will know uh, if TSH high and free T4 low, the diagnosis is primary hypothyroidism. 
and if both low we can say secondary hypothyroidism but there are some condition like sick euthyroid syndrome it can present with normal things and abnormal one thyroid function result and subclinical disorders are present uh, like for example subclinical hypothyroidism tsh high but function result how to interpret the thyroid function result and subclinical hypothyroidism uh, usually elevated tsh with free t for normal level and tsh usually less than 10 mu per liter and if you do anti tpo antibody 60 to 80 percentage positive and if the tsh less than 10 10 we usually say mild hypothyroidism and if more than 10 10 we can say hypothyroidism but this is subclinical hypothyroidism and some patient they have symptoms of hypothyroidism other patient uh, they don't have symptoms of hypothyroidism so this is a study they compared uh, the clinical features of subclinical hypothyroidism so subclinical hypothyroidism they may present without any symptom or they may present with symptom and usual symptoms of weight gain fatigue lethargy dry hair and alopecia so why we need to worry about hypothyroidism because hypothyroidism affect uh, each and every part of the body because associated important comorbidities cardiovascular disease because hypothyroidism itself increase uh, to develop uh, the disease like increase the morbidity due to cardiovascular disease and increased chance of diabetes and dyslipidemia even depression and subfertility or infertility so that's why the screening of hypothyroidism is very common uh, for suspected cases so if you see the cardiovascular risk associated with hypothyroidism hypothyroidism can cause atherogenic lipid profile and increase the tg and increase the ldl and abnormal hemodynamics impair the cardiac contractility and diastolic function and increase the systemic vascular resistance and it also impaired the endothelial function and hypothyroidism it can cause hypercoagulable state and abnormal non-traditional risk factors for example lipoprotein a and homocysteine crp uh, these are called non-traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease so hypothyroidism itself increase the cardiovascular risk by various means so how to manage hypothyroidism so whenever we diagnose hypothyroidism with clinical features and biochemical result we need to treat so these are the three uh, these are the goals why we need to treat hypothyroidism first one is normalize tsh level level regardless of course of hypothyroidism so we need to normalize the thyroid function second treatment is thyroxine there are so many guidelines even the sri lankan guideline is there for thyroid uh, management and uh, we need to monitor the tsh level frequently initially more frequently then uh, depend on the patient clinical feature and biochemical result we can monitor so as i mentioned earlier the goal is to control the thyroid function state and uh, control the physiological level of thyroid function state and alleviate signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism and treatment treatment of hypothyroidism should be tailored to individual needs and uh, treatment of choice is levothyroxine replacement therapy there are so many guidelines like ata guideline american thyroid association guideline american college of endocrinologist guideline and sri lanka college of endocrinologist guideline uh, that clearly mentioned uh, how to manage uh, hypothyroidism and hypothyroidism so synthetic t4 thyroxine is the treatment for hypothyroidism all type of hypothyroidism we need to treat thyroxine sometimes nodule and subacute or chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis or Hashimoto's also we need to treat with uh, thyroxine. Uh, awaiting surgery, postoperative and radioiodine treatment also we need to uh, treat with thyroxine, especially thyroid malignancies. Uh, thyroxine, liver thyroxine sodium has a narrow therapeutic range and careful titration is important. Otherwise, uh, a patient may encounter with over or under treatment of uh, the disease. 
So even small changes in the dose can shift a patient from euthyroid to hypo or hypothyroid. And um, so it's better to give the same brand of thyroxine throughout the treatment because if you have a change, uh, it can affect the quality and management. So how to manage or how to start treatment of thyroxine in an adult patient? A usual starting dose is 1.6 microgram per kilogram per day. For example, a 60 kilogram patient, the dose is 100 microgram per day. So elderly patients, usually more than 65 years with cardiovascular disease. So we may start with small dose. For example, we can start 25 microgram per day and gradually increase to 50 and then depending on the weight, we can gradually increase by weeks. But young patient, less than 50 years, no cardiovascular mortality, no need to worry and no need to start with small dose. Straight away, you can start usual dose. For example, 60 kilogram gentleman with hypothyroidism, TSH more than 100, we can start 100 microgram per day. So adjust the dose depend on the next TSH result and we need to advise patient about how to take thyroxine. So usually we need to say, otherwise our patient, they will take in a different method and it affect the absorption. So there should be a gap to 45 to 60 minutes before next, uh, before the meal or drink coffee or tea. And ask the patient if possible, uh, take uh, in the same time and keep uh, the thyroxine medication in a cool, dry place. And uh, uh, don't take other medication with thyroxine. That's very important because uh, especially the omeprazole and calcium and iron, if a patient take with thyroxine, it affect the absorption. Sometimes elderly patients, they forget, tend to forget to take thyroxine. So we may keep alarm or guided thyroid uh, prescription is important. So full replacement for young patient and uh, monitor the TSH. And we need to adjust the dose depending on the patient's body weight, age, and uh, TSH report and pregnancy. So initially we may do after four to six weeks and depending on the TSH report, we can titrate the dose of thyroxine. When the thyroid function is stable, then we can do four months, six months, or even once a year is enough. So factors to determine the thyroid dose, first one is patient's weight and uh, the body mass, BMI or weight, pregnancy status and etiology and age and general clinical context and the results of thyroid function. So subclinical hypothyroidism, so persistently elevated TSH, that means free T4 is within normal, but TSH is high. So TSH may be more than 10 or TSH may be more than 4.5, just above the TSH level. So first of all, we need to assess the symptoms and signs of hypothyroidism. Subclinical hypothyroidism also, they may present with symptom or without symptom. So there's a management guideline, how to manage a subclinical hypothyroidism. So we can divide into two categories, mildly elevated TSH, that means the TSH level in between 4.5 to 10. The second one is markedly elevated TSH, that means more than 10. And uh, so if it is markedly elevated, that means the chance to go into overt hypothyroidism is very high. And markedly elevated TSH uh, patient need, usually need treatment. Mildly elevated TSA, that means in between 4.5 to 10. So we may need to do antibodies like anti TPO antibody. And there are special indications. For example, any female pregnant or any female planning pregnancy, subfertile, growing age, need treatment. So why we need to worry about the diagnosis of subclinical hypothyroidism? Because subclinical hypothyroidism itself, the abnormal thyroid function, alter the cardiac function lipid profile and possibly adverse cardiovascular outcome and the progression to overt hypothyroidism is five percentage per year so that's why we need to think about subclinical hypothyroidism so in this graph you can see how it changed subclinical hypothyroid patient to overt hypothyroidism so this is a meta-analysis. They have compared alteration of lipid profile in subclinical hypothyroidism and uh, serum 
total cholesterol ldl and triglyceride level increase under subclinical hypothyroidism and but no significant association with serum hdl level and higher level of total cholesterol ldl and triglyceride level increase the risk of cardiovascular morbidity and more mortality so therefore the cardiovascular status of subclinical hypothyroid patient or hypothyroid patient we need to monitor carefully that is one of the important message here and this is one of the meta-analyses seven randomized control trial clearly mentioned significant improvement in serum ldl was revealed with treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism and high level of plasma ldl level associated with occurrence of coronary artery disease so thyroxine treatment reduced the risk of coronary artery disease So here you can see again, in a subclinical hypothyroid patient, when TSH level more than 10, the hazard ratio for cardiovascular disease almost double. So we need to keep all these things in our mind. So there are so many guidelines they recommend when you need to treat subclinical hypothyroidism. So as I mentioned earlier, if a patient with positive antibodies, evidence of atherovascular cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or patient planning pregnancy, preconception, growing age need to be treated. Uh, because uh, subfertility is very common these days. And uh, so usually we do TSH level in any patient with subfertility. And if TSH level more than 2.5, usually we treat, not like other patients, because marginally elevated TSH also affect the fertility. So the cutoff for TSH to treat uh, subfertility in a subclinical hypothyroid patient is around 2.5. So then we'll move to pregnancy and hypothyroid uh, issues. That's very important. Here you can see the trimester specific ranges of uh, TSH. So there are so many guidelines. So the Indian guideline is similar to Sri Lankan guideline. You can see the first trimester TSH cutoff is 2.5. Second and third trimester is three. So we need to know the cutoff, trimester specific TSH cutoff. And in pregnancy, uh, we need to go with both TSH and free T4 because if you do TSH for a normal female, pregnant female also, TSH may be zero point something like that, very low. Uh, why that is because of the hcg effect in first trimester so don't just go with tsh in pregnancy we need to do free t4 level as well uh, we need to keep the free t4 level within the mid range or upper range of normal value so if it is low normal or low so we need to treat the pregnant lady because hypothyroidism adversely affect the fetal and maternal outcome so there's a special condition called isolated or hypothyroxinemia in pregnancy TSH may be low normal but t4 is persistently low so we need to keep all these things in our mind and uh, during pregnancy tsa target is 2.5 if more than 2.5 we should treat the patient and the regime is 1.6 around 1.6 microgram per kilogram per day and monitoring, we need to monitor with TSH plus free T4 initially after one, or one month or six weeks. And we need to keep the free T4 within the mid range or upper range. And TSA targets, we know. And uh, one of the important message we need to say to the patient, uh, we need to normalize the thyroid status in preconception period. So if any female conceive with abnormal thyroid function, it affects the fetus. So we need to normalize the thyroid function in a preconception female before become uh, pregnant. And uh, so any female planning pregnancy, if TSH more than 2.5, so we need to treat the patient and normalize the thyroid status before pregnancy. And we need to advise the patient, if you become pregnant, don't stop the thyroxine treatment. Ideally, you need to increase the dose of thyroxine uh, around 30 percent for example uh, if a preconception lady on thyroxine 75 microgram if she become pregnant she need to increase the thyroxine dosage by 200 microgram daily and then meet the doctor otherwise what will happen uh, uh, because of this current situation the repeat and 
uh, visit clinic, patient may come to our clinic after two months, first trimester over. The first trimester is the golden period for fetal brain and somatic development. So we need to think about that uh, in starting or advise pregnant ladies. And the other thing is after, uh, during uh, pregnancy, we need to monitor the TSH with free T4 level and uh, adjust the dose of thyroxine. Usually we need to increase gradually uh, the thyroxine dosage. And after delivery, we may revert back to the pre-pregnancy dose. And uh, we can check the thyroid status after one or two months. So that's an important message. We need to monitor TSH and free T4 during pregnancy. We need to closely monitor the thyroid status and we need to keep the free T4 within the mid range of the normal range because hypothyroidism is the one affect the fetus uh, during a pregnancy. So all these guidelines uh, joined Sri Lanka College of Endocrinologists and Sri Lanka College of Obstetrician guideline is available. Uh, we can get it for the management of hypothyroidism. Any female with pregnancy and hypothyroidism, it should be managed in a specialized care center. So it's better to refer to a, a nearest endocrine clinic. So thank you. This is uh, just uh, about hypothyroidism. Uh, then I want to talk something about hyperthyroidism in a few minutes. So can you see the slides? Yes, sir, we can see the slides. Okay, then we'll move to the management of thyrotoxicosis. And uh, uh, thyrotoxicosis management is a little bit difficult because uh, we may encounter diagnostic challenges and management challenges and management challenges in special situation like pregnancy and children and crisis. And um, so thyrotoxicosis is uh, just opposite to hypothyroidism. Usually patient present with restlessness, fatigue, irritability, and weight loss, uh, altered bowel function like loose tool, heat intolerant, palpitation, and abnormal menstruation like uh, oligomenorrhea. And uh, thyrotoxicosis patient, Graves disease, they may present with eye signs like exophthalmos or a lid lag, lid retraction, or chemosis. So the careful examination is important, including eye signs. Look for the thyroid goiter, whether it is a diffuse goiter or nodular goiter, uh, if nodule single or multiple nodule. And we need to check the cardiovascular system, including pulse, blood pressure, and uh, all the peripheral signs. And uh, so for the, the uh, how to diagnose hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis, we need to do TSH and free T4 level. So just opposite to primary hypothyroidism here, TSH is low and free T4 is high. In any patient with typical thyrotoxic symptom, TSH very low and free T4 high, the diagnosis is primary. That means problem in the gland, thyrotoxicosis. So if any patient symptomatic, typical symptom, TSH very low, but free T4 within normal range, we need to suspect two things. One is it may be T3 toxicosis or subclinical hypothyroidism. So any patient with thyrotoxic symptom, TSA low, free T4 normal, we need to do free T3. Then we can say free T3 high, T3 toxicosis. But if free T3 also within normal range, but symptomatic, then we need to consider it as subclinical hypothyroidism. So what are the three important causes for thyrotoxicosis? The common causes are diffuse goiter, that is Graves, other one is solitary toxic nodule and third one, toxic multinodular goiter. So other uncommon causes, thyroiditis, iatrogenic, drug-induced, and rare causes, thyroid-secreting pituitary tumor-like uh, TSH OMA. So uptake scan, uh, we don't have much facilities in our country, but uptake scan is a good scan. We can differentiate uh, the cause of 
thyrotoxicol. Here you can see thyroiditis, uh, we can see not much uptake, but Graves disease, you can see the diffuse uptake of uh, iodine and the nucleus scan and toxic nodular goiter, you can see multiple nodular uptake. So these are the condition causing high uptake in nucleus can cause Graves disease, toxic nodule, toxic multinodular goiter and other thing, and low uptake in thyroiditis and excess iodine exposure and exogenous thyroid hormone. So Graves disease, not a disease of thyroid disease because Graves patient, they present with ophthalmopathy, dermopathy and thyroid acropathy. Dermopathy means skin changes. The main one is pretibial mixed edema and thyroid acropathy is the nail changes like clubbing. So there's an antibody called TSA receptor antibody we can do, the antibody called trap antibody uh, because in a uh, thyroid ophthalmopathy and pregnancy, for example, sometimes very difficult to dif distinguish or differentiate uh, thyrotoxicosis in pregnancy. So we may do TSA receptor antibody, atypical cases. And if you worry about fetal or neonatal thyroid dysfunction, we can do TSH receptor antibody, but it's not available in hospital setup and the cost is around more than 20,000. So we rarely do the TSH receptor antibodies. So when we consider the management of thyrotoxicosis, there are three options. One is medical management, other one is radioiodine treatment, and third one is surgery. So the usual treatment regime for a diffuse goiter is 12 to 18 months or maximum two years. So usually the medical management is the one we are practicing in our country. And we usually treat the patient for 12 to 18 months or maximum two years. So usually well respond to medical treatment. Sometimes diffuse goiter also after two years or so poor response to medical treatment. So those patients need to undergo definitive treatment. So diffuse goiter, the best option is go for radioiodine treatment. So in other countries like US, straight away they start radioiodine treatment, not a medical treatment. So thyrotoxicosis, the reason is multinodular goiter or toxic multinodular goiter. The best management is surgery, thyroidectomy. So no need to wait for two years, just control the thyroid status with antithyroid medication, maybe a three months or six months or one year. If the thyroid status is okay, then we can refer to surgeon for thyroidectomy. So we need to keep all these in our mind. So when we consider the medical treatment, available drugs, carbimazole, medimazole, and propithyroxine, in our setup, the first line drug, we use carbimazole. And there are drugs called iodide, lithium, and symptomatic management treatment we may need to consider for some patient. Now, if we consider the half-life of carbimazole, it's around six hours, and propithyroxine is 1.5 hours. Both carbimazole and PTU cross the placenta, but PTU lesser extent. So for example, it's, uh, if a 40-year-old gentleman present with typical thyrotoxic symptom, pulse rate 100 per minute, and free T4 is very high, TS is very low, the first management treatment plan is we need to educate the patient. You are having thyrotoxicosis and usual treatment regime and our management plan. Usually we start carbimazole. The carbimazole dose depend on the patient clinical feature and biochemical result. If the biochemical result, for example, free T4 is very high, more than six, we can start carbimazole 15 milligram three times a day. So for example, free T4 is two or three, slightly elevated, you can start 10 milligram TDS or 10 milligram BD. All depend on the patient clinical features and biochemical result. For example, pulse rate is more than 100 patient symptomatic, we, we can start uh, um, symptomatic treatment like beta blocker, like proper 40 milligram TDS or BD or 20 BD, depend on the pulse rate. But we need to ask about contraindication like bronchial asthma or COPD. And if contraindication, we can start calcium channel blocker like diltiasm or verapamil. This symptomatic treatment, not for two years, because the next visit patient pulse may be bradycardia. So we need to reduce or stop uh, this symptomatic management. Whenever we start carbimazole, we need to educate the patient about the side effect of carbimazole. And that is very important because mine aging is common. If mine aging, we can continue with antihistamine treatment. If severe aging or rashes, we need to stop. And if patient develop any neutropenia or agranulocytosis or neutropenic sepsis, we need to advise 
uh, how to stop it and meet the doctor and do the full blood count and immediate management plan. And uh, there are some, and if you start carbimazole, then the next investigation in six weeks time, we need to do TSH and free T4. Depend on the thyroid function, we need to uh, titrate the dose of carbimazole. The titration is usually like this. Gradually reduce the uh, treatment for 18 to 24 months. So don't just go with TSH because if you just do TSH, TSH may be low throughout the year. TSH may be 0.05 because the TSH suppression may persist for years. So better to go with free T4 as well. And if free T4 is low, normal or low, that in, it clearly indicate this hyperthyroid patient is going into hypothyroidism. So if free T4 is low or low normal, we need to reduce the dose of carbimazole. Don't just chop the carbimazole. That is the important message. For example, a lot of junior doctors, if you start carbimazole after a few months, TSH may be high, like in a hypothyroid status. Some people stop carbimazole and start thyroxine. Some people straight away stop the carbimazole. That is not the way. Gradual tail off of carbimazole is very important. If a patient on carbimazole 15 TDS, the TSH result is abnormal like hypothyroidism, we may reduce to 10 BD. Then close monitoring and adjust the dose of carbimazole. That is very important. And there are some conditions we can use uh, carbimazole. One of the important condition is preconception. Any female planning pregnancy, we need to change to propyl thyroid And first trimester of pregnancy, drug of choice is PTO. But don't just wait for the pregnancy. Before the pregnancy preconception, we need to start the PTO because otherwise the uh, female, they become pregnant and come to our clinic after two to three months first trimester over. So any preconception female change carbimazole to propythyracil and first trimester is the second indication and third indication is breastfeeding and fourth indication is thyrotoxic crisis or thyroid storm. So we need to keep in mind. And uh, PTU is a dangerous drug. Propythyracil can cause hepatotoxicity. Don't give PTU unnecessarily and uh, contraindication in second and third trimester of pregnancy. And uh, there are some other drugs, resistant thyrotoxicosis, we may start iodine treatment. For example, patient waiting for thyroid surgery, preoperative preparation, treatment of thyrotoxic crisis, we can uh, use iodine like Lugol's iodine. There are different regime, three to five or eight drops, three times a day. We can start for 10 days or 14 days to control the thyroid status. And like lithium is one of the important drugs we may combine with carbimazole or in a patient reaction to carbimazole, waiting for other definitive treatment like radio iodine or surgery, we may consider, but lithium also narrow therapeutic index and dangerous drugs. So we need to monitor for symptoms of adverse effect and monitor the lithium level as well. So symptomatic management we have mentioned earlier, and there are some factors favor long-term remission. So for example, if a patient small goiter, normal TSH, antibody is negative, and size reduced during therapy, we may say this patient will good response to antithyroid medication. If it is a multinodular goiter, TPO antibody very high, sorry, TSA receptor antibody very high, very large tumor. So we need to think this one need definitive treatment like surgery. So here you can see the TSA record from a patient. Uh, it may be a different unit, but you, you can see it. They have started 30 milligram carbimazole per day and continued for several months, initially okay, but you can see here at this point, uh, T4 is low normal because five to 12 is normal, 3.5 low normal, but at that point also they have continued the same dose and next clinic visit, you can see free T4 is very low and TSH very high. So what we should have done, we should have changed the carbimazole dose at this point. So that is an important clear message here. Follow up one, Thyroid function normalized, we need to monitor the thyroid status. The best uh, treatment monitoring is TSH with free T4 level. And total duration we have mentioned and uh, um, relapse. Reappearance of hyperthyroid status is common, rate is around 50 percentage. So don't just for two years and stop the monitoring. We need to monitor initially first three to six months and then at least six a month or year, we need to monitor the patient for any relapse. 
And we need to know something about radio iodine treatment, how to prepare radio iodine treatment, uh, what are the contraindication um, uh, for radio iodine treatment, and how to prepare a radio iodine treatment for a thyroid resistant patient. Surgery very large tumor with retrosternal extension or multi nodular goiter, any female planning pregnancy, can't manage with medical treatment, not willing for radio iodine treatment. So, and like grapes, ophthalmopathy, and some people, thyrotoxicosis with coexisting hyperparathyroidism. These people need surgery as the curative treatment. And pregnancy is another challenge in thyrotoxicosis because it can cause adverse outcome like miscarriage, IUD, low birth weight, and congenital malformation, preterm delivery, neonatal mortality, and maternal cardiac failure. So that's why uh, we need to address thyrotoxicosis status also clearly during pregnancy. For example, uh, for example, first trimester, first trimester of pregnancy, sometimes we can see low TSA. Don't be panicked. This TSA low may be due to HCG effect. So we need to check the patient for thyrotoxic status, clinical features, and signs. Look for thyroid goiter and ask for family history of any hyperthyroidism. So patient may present with hyperemesis gravidera. And if you do free T4, it may be slightly high. So no need to start thyroid medication at this point. You may manage symptomatically. Hyperemesis, IV fluid, and you may give antiemetics. And uh, depending on the pulse, you may give beta block or other drugs with VOG's advice. But we need to differentiate whether this is a transient gestational thyrotoxicosis or Graves' disease during pregnancy. It may be Graves. Patient may present with eye sign, thyroid goiter, and free T4 may be high. In that condition, we need to treat the patient with antithyroid medication. Keep in mind, First trimester, propyl thiouracil is the treatment of choice. And second and third trimester, carbimazole is the treatment of choice. So any patient with altered thyroid function during pregnancy should be referred to a specialized center. Better to refer to a nearest endocrine clinic because they need specialized care. And the monitoring again in pregnancy also with free T4 and TSH. Don't just go with TSH. And uh, we need to keep the free T4 and TSH within the range with the treatment. And TSH receptor antibody, there's a place, but uh, because of the poor facilities, we don't do it here. Ideal setup we need to do before pregnancy and again third trimester uh, because it predicts the risk of neonatal toxicosis and postpartum recurrence. And we need to know something about how to change the PTU to carbimazole because carbimazole 10 milligram is equal to propyl thioracyl 100. So 10 is to 1 ratio. If you switch off or switch on to other drug, we need to know the ratio. And a very sad story, unfortunately, because of the current situation, most of the hospital, they don't have propyl thioracyl. So we need to do something to get propyl thioracyl and some hospital, even carbimazole not available. So untreated thyrotoxicosis or grave disease can cause fetal or neonatal hypothyroidism, fetal or neonatal hypothyroidism, and central hypothyroidism. So if you see the challenges in children and uh, inability to achieve revision, sometimes difficult to manage in children, and long-term treatment may be uh, necessary, and abnormal thyroid function has an impact on growth and maturity, and we have concern about long-term treatment like radio iodine and surgery. So management in children is uh, different. So the next uh, thing we need to know something about thyroid nodule. If any patient come with nodule, we need to be careful. That's why the scan is important, especially the female. If any nodule, we need to arrange ultrasound and ultrasound guided FNAC. Why that is important? Because thyroid malignancy is very common. Papillary carcinoma is very common and treatable not like other malignancies. Thyroid malignancy, the prognosis is good and the chance to die or the mortality rate is very minimal. So early diagnosis of thyroid malignancy is important. You all know a differentiated and undifferentiated carcinoma. Papillary carcinoma is the commonest one. And then follicular, there are medullary carcinoma and 
anaplastic carcinoma is the dangerous one. So if any carcinoma patient, we need to have a multidisciplinary approach with uh, endocrinologist or physician, with surgeon and uh, oncologist. And uh, so any nodule malignancy, they need to undergo surgery. Uh, any suspicious case, for example, intermediate, for example, there's a classification system called Bethesda, Thai 1, 2, 3, like 5. If it is Thai 3 or follicular proliferation, we need to refer to a surgeon. If Thai 4 or Bethesda 4 or 5, they need definitive treatment like total thyroidectomy. After thyroidectomy also, we need to refer to oncologist and we need to keep TSH in a very low, minimal TSH suppression is important to prevent recurrence. We need to monitor the patient closely with thyroid ultrasound and thyroglobulin and with antibody. So we need to keep the thyroglobulin less than two and depend on the case and TSH suppression is very important. And uh, that's all about uh, thyroid disorders. We are, I think we have covered uh, the main diseases like hypothyroidism and hypothyroidism during pregnancy, thyrotoxicosis, thyrotoxicosis during pregnancy and nodules and something about uh, thyroid uh, malignancies. So again, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, discuss something about thyroid uptake in this prestigious day. Uh, thank you very much, sir. We have received some questions and we need your clarification. So getting straight to the question, sir. Okay. Uh, the, the first question is, um, the audience want to know, uh, since the thyroid profile contains T3 and T4, which is specific for hyperthyroidism? So hyperthyroidism also, usually we do TSH and free T4. If TSH is very low, free T4 is high, the diagnosis is hyperthyroidism, no need to worry. But the thing is the TSH low and free T4 normal, then we can do free T3, then we can say this is T3 toxicosis. So for example, in hospital setup, most of the time we don't have T3. So we go with T4 and TSH. Uh, next question, sir. How do we differentiate sick thyroid patient and a hypopituitarism patient? So usually hypopituitarism, the TSH is low and free T4 is low. But in sick, the thing is different. For example, TSH, so here both low, but in sick, TA1 is low and other one is normal. So that's, and we can ask the history, reason is your fever or infection. And then we can repeat the investigation after some time and we can differentiate whether it is due to sick thyroid or pituitary secondary cause. This is a very timely question, sir. In the primary care setting, since with the current situation of the country, with the history and examination suggestive of a hypothyroid patient, do we still need to do both TSH and free T4 before we start treatment? So ideally, because of the current situation, we may just do TSH. For example, if a typical hypothyroid patient, TSH is very high, that means more than 10 or 20 or something like that. So no need to do free T4 because we know the diagnosis. This is primary hypothyroid. So we may do like that. Our audience want to know, sir, the, the relationship between hypothyroidism and anemia. Hyper or hypo? Hyper. So usually hypothyroidism is anemia, very common because hypothyroidism is one of the reasons for macrocytic anemia. And hypothyroid female, they usually present with menorrhagia and they may present with anemia, iron deficiency anemia. And the other thing, all these thyroid disorders, even hypo, hypothyroidism, autoimmunity is the main reason. So they may present with other autoimmune disorders. They may have pernicious anemia. So the association with anemia is common. It happens in both hypothyroidism and hypothyroidism. Uh, in a clinical setting, if an elderly patient who is already treated for hypothyroidism, uh, if we repeat the investigations and it shows subclinical hypothyroidism without any symptoms, how does the management change and what is the place for antibodies in this patient? So elderly patient already diagnosed hypothyroidism or subclinical hypothyroid, hypothyroidism? Hypothyroidism, sir, now presenting with the repeated investigations showing subclinical hypothyroidism without so symptoms. Means, so that means this patient already diagnosed hypothyroidism with treatment. Yes. Now, now like subclinical hypothyroidism, no? Yes. 
So then we need to treat, we need to continue the treatment, but just forget about hypothyroidism. This is a subclinical hypothyroidism, elderly patient. So if TSA less than 10, patient is asymptomatic, no need to worry. We need to just monitor the thyroid function, TSA. Uh, if TSA more than 10, and we can do antibodies, and if antibody is positive, uh, it, the management decision is individualized. If more than 10 with antibody positive, we may start small dose of thyroxine. If less than 10, so we need to go with antibody and design. But young patients, especially preconception, planning pregnancy, pregnant female, and growing age, we need to treat aggressively. We need to treat subclinical hypothyroidism. Another clinical scenario, sir. Uh, if a patient presents to us with a swinging TSH level, um, what is the optimum TSH level to start thyroxine if the patient doesn't have any symptoms? That means we have mentioned you know, like subclinical hypothyroidism, if more than 10, so usually we need to treat. If less than 10, there are so many options. We can do antibodies. If antibody positive, you may treat. If negative, you need to wait. But there are special conditions, as I mentioned, preconception, pregnancy, and young age, growing age, because it affects the height, so we need to treat. And next question, sir. This is a statement. Uh, is reduced TSH level in 2.5% in a normal population normal? Is this a correct statement? Please tell Redu again. 2.5% uh, of the population has reduced TSH level. Yeah, it may be correct, no, because the this abnormal thyroid, because we are, these days a lot of people do thyroid function as a screening and those things, and sometimes we overdiagnose. So uh, that's why without symptoms, uh, if you do un unnecessary thyroid function, we are in a trouble. And we need to be careful. If you have any doubt, do the free T4 as well before starting any treatment. Next question, sir. Is obesity also an indication to treat subclinical hypothyroidism? So there are no hard and fast indication to treat obesity, but in our practice, sometimes young patient with obesity and subclinical hypothyroid, anyway, young patient we treat no, if uh, TSH is high because of subclinical hypothyroid, there's a clear indication for the weight loss also, we can start thyroxine. Next question, sir. In uh, dequane thyroiditis, why does the dose uptake scan show suppression? Uh, does the dose uptake scan show suppression in even though they are hyperthyroid? In Ducoin? Yes. So usually um, uh, it depends on the uptake and thyroglobulin level. Sometimes uh, different thyroiditis, different, different uptake. And um, so, for example, there are different uh, renal thyroiditis like fibrosis, and uh, there are thyroiditis like decomine. And uh, most of the time, decomine, as you have mentioned, the uptake is low. But uh, but that condition also. So I I, I would check it and let you know. Um, next question, sir. Do we need to do a baseline full blood count and liver function tests before starting antithyroid drugs? So it's better to do because sometimes if any abnormalities in the count or abnormalities in the liver function, and if you start treatment and if we monitor with altered things, we don't have any idea. So it's better to have a baseline full blood count and LFT before starting treatment. Then only we can say what is the abnormality. But the routine monitoring of full blood count and LFT is not recommended in the management of thyrotoxia. If patient develop any symptoms or signs, we need to do the liver function of full blood count. So you mentioned about uh, switching between carbamazole and PTU in pregnant uh, patients. Yeah. Our audience wants to know about the efficacy between carbamazole and PTU in a pregnant and a non-pregnant mother. So usually the efficacy is not a problem here because why we switch is the side effect and we need to consider about the teratogenicity. That's why we change PTU and PTU is the drug, drug of choice in first trimester, but we don't give in second and third because the uh, uh, dangerous side effect is hepatotoxicity. So the, the main issue is the safety measures here. Um, our audience also wants to know, sir, in Graves' disease, is the T3 always high? Not always, not always. We need to do 
three T four. Sometimes three T four is very high. Sometimes both high. Sometimes T three is fine. Um, so you also mentioned about keeping our thyroid gland suppressed during a CA diagnosis yeah. patient. Our audience want to know what is the lower cutoff to maintain the suppression. So there are different cutoff. We need to classify the carcinoma. For example, papillary carcinoma also mild, moderate, severe, and depend on the metastasis and other thing. There's a TSH suppression level 0.1. There's a so there's a chart is there. So if some people need, we need to keep the TSH around 0.1. Some patient with severe disease less than 0.1. So the TSH suppression is important to prevent the recurrence. And uh, so that's why we need to do both TSH and free T4. We may keep the free T4 in the upper normal or middle range, but we need to keep in mind TSH suppression and thyroglobulin also around 0.1 or less than 0.1, depend on the patient clinical status. Another question concerning Graves' eye disease, sir. Uh, the audience want to know the place of usage of selenium. So in other countries, people use selenium, but uh, no large scale randomized controlled trial to say the selenium is uh, superior or selenium is beneficial, but we need to have more, more and more studies. But the main thing is uh, uh, Graves' orbitopathy, the control of thyroid status. We need to keep the patient U thyroid and we need to use some general measures, closing the eyes and avoid uh, these things and cover the eyes and uh, in, depend on the severity, there's a classifying scale called UGOGO. Uh, it, the scoring system is up to seven. We can download in the Google. And if it is more than three, we can say severe uh, Graves orbitopathy. So then we need to treat with steroids, depend on the severity, oral steroid or IV steroid with gradual titration or dose reduction. Another clinical scenario, sir. An elderly patient with dyslipidemia and subclinical hypothyroidism. What should be our mainstay of treatment? So, anyway, subclinical hypothyroidism is one of the reasons for dyslipidemia, and uh, the dyslipidemia may, may, may be another issue. So, we need to balance both things and uh, uh, we need to treat. We need to start statin, depend on the lipid profile, LDL and triglyceride and total cholesterol cutoff. And, uh, if any indication to treat subclinical hypothyroidism, we need to treat. Otherwise, we can monitor. Next question, sir. Uh, the place of cardiac arrhythmias that occurs in thyroid disorders. So, the, for example, in thyrotoxicosis, untreated thyrotoxicosis, they may present abnormal arrhythmias, especially atrial fibrillation. Their first presentation may be AF with cardiac failure. So that's why the diagnosis, early diagnosis is important. They may present with anything like SPT or anything. So that's why they may present with thyrotoxic crisis or storm. That storm condition also the monitoring, monitoring of the cardiac rhythm is very important and appropriate management we need to do. Um, next question is also on management, sir. Our audience want to know to an outline management of mixed uh, coma. Uh, mixed edema coma, anyway, that uh, general principles like ABs, the airway, breathing, circulation, admit the patient ETU and put IV fluid. And um, uh, general measures important, uh, IV fluids and gradual rewarming is important. Patient present with hypothermia. And uh, other important thing is uh, we need to give thyroxine. Patient thyroid mixed edema coma, no? So patient may present with unconscious or semi-conscious. So we can't just give oral thyroxine, we can put an NG. We don't have IV thyroxine in Sri Lanka. We can give loading dose like 300 microgram or something like the loading dose. And then daily we can give 150 or 100 or 200 depending on the patient weight and biochemical result. The general and supportive measures important. And we may need to start IV hydrocortisone. So usually we start because associated uh, steroid deficiency or cortisol deficiency may be common and we need to treat uh, any electrolyte abnormalities like hyponatremia and antibiotics may be needed for any infection. So um, we want to know uh, for you to explain to our audience the instances when we need to refer these thyroid diseases to an endocrinologist and a specialized unit. So one of the important thing is hypothyroidism can be managed in any primary care center. They need to go to a tertiary care center or secondary care center once in six months or once a year. And thyrotoxicosis anyway should be managed in a secondary or tertiary care. They need to be managed in a 
medical clinic or endocrine clinic. And if possible, thyrotoxicosis is better to refer to endocrine clinic. And other thing is any thyroid diseases in pregnancy, it may be hypothyroidism or thyrotoxicosis, it's better to refer to endocrine clinic. A lot of our questions are concerning uh, patients who are um, awaiting pregnancy and who are pregnant. So can you, will you be able to highlight again uh, the ranges of TSH and T4 or the uh, starting point of when if okay, a patient okay. is awaiting pregnancy? Okay. And the thing is, I want to highlight the subfertility is very common these days. And uh, there are so many subfertile female uninvestigated. Uh, for example, two days back, I have seen a patient subfertile for five years, her TSH is 10. The simple measure is just treat with thyroxine, subfertile for five years. So the pregnancy preconception TSA target is less than 2.5. Normally we say 4 or 4.5 for normal person, for example, male. So any female TSA is 3.5, even three, we need to consider treatment. So we may need to do antibodies, but we need to treat. We can start a small dose like 25 or 50 and monitor the patient. And uh, the TSA target should be less than, the preconception target is less than 2.5. And if she become pregnant, we need to tell any thyroid patient or subclinical hypothyroid patient, they need to increase the dose by, for example, 25 microgram. If any female preconception, 75 microgram, and if she become pregnant, she need to increase the dose to 100, urine HCG positive. Otherwise, what will happen if you don't educate the patient, they will stop the treatment or they won't increase the dose. And because of the current situation, they will come to our clinic after two or three months. The first trimester, the golden period of time over. The best period for fetal uh, brain development and somatic development is over. So we need to clearly mention whenever urine HCG positive, you need to increase the dose and meet the doctor immediately for or after one week for thyroid function status. And during pregnancy also, we need to carefully monitor the thyroid function, ideally six weeks to eight weeks, and don't just do the TSH. Why that is important? TSH may be very low in first trimester, even second trimester, because of the HCG effect. So always do free T4 and keep the free T4 in the middle range or upper range of the normal range. So for example, in a pregnant a female POA 12 weeks, free T4 low normal and TSH low. Don't worry about TSA. Free T4 is low normal, patient symptomatic, increase the dose. So gradually increase the dose. And after delivery, you may reduce to preconception or pre-pregnancy thyroxine dose. We have a few minutes for a few more questions. Sir. Uh, okay. One question is, can a hypothyroid patient have a normal TSH and a low free T4, or is it just a technical error in the laboratory? So if patient is symptomatic and if you see a report like a TSA uh, normal and 3T4 low, it's uncommon. So we need to repeat. So usually in pregnancy time, sometimes we can see it. There's a condition called hypothyroxemia during pregnancy. TSH uh, may be normal, but 3T4 low. So that management, individualized management, depend on the patient clinical feature and biochemical result, we need to treat. But whenever we see these uh, abnormal result and not compatible with clinical feature, we need to repeat it in a proper manner. And people usually these days say, do thyroid function in a fasting state, the morning sound. Uh, yeah. Time for one final question. Uh, okay. with, the, with the current crisis and the shortage of drugs, how are we going to manage patients who are presenting with symptoms of hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism? So most of the time, hypothyroidism, we can manage easily because thyroxine is available. But the problem with antithyroid medication, for the last few months, propythyroxine not available, even in tertiary care center. We, reasonably, we have got, and even in outside pharmacies, we can't get. And carbimazole is also very difficult. So we don't know how to manage during first trimester and preconception. So I think uh, the powerful institutions and organizations should emphasize this issue to the government, the importance of this important medication. This is a life-saving medication. 
Um, so this is another question. I think, sir, you have explained about this. Uh, in hyperthyroidism with pregnancy, what is the best time to convert from carbamazepine to procrathyroidin? So uh, that's preconception. For example, if a female planning pregnancy, don't start carbamazole. Why that is important? If you start carbamazole and if she become pregnant, she'll come to your clinic after one or two months. The first trimester part is over. So any female fertile age group, not on any contraception or not on any long-term contraception, no LRT, better to start profile thyroidism and clearly inform about the side effects. And uh, whenever she become pregnant throughout first trimester, continue PTU. And when first trimester over, change to carbimazole. So that is important. Don't start propylthorazine whenever she become pregnant. Better to start preconception. That's important. So I think we have only time for that much of questions. Okay. I want to express my sincere thanks and gratitude uh, to Dr. Aravind and Mahalingam the consultant endocrinologist attached to Teaching Hospital Jaffna for this very concise and extensive lecture on thyroid disorders. Uh, thank you for sharing your Sunday and your precious time with all of us. And our audience, thank you for being interactive. Please sending any other questions you all have to, through to, to us so that we can forward it to Sir and uh, get, get back to you with our answers. Uh, we hope you all have a very productive and very stress-free week with this current situation. And uh, please find the link in our chat box uh, to fill in the post-assessment questions uh, to receive your e-certificate following this webinar. And we invite you again to join us next Sunday with another very interactive and timely topic in our Sri webinar series. We like to extend our special gratitude to the College of Internal Medicine to, for joining with us again this week and arranging this very informative and timely lecture. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you.